I will kick this wicked system as long as I live and breathe because it has ki destroyed Christian churches. Let's cover Calvinism once more. Psalms chapter 65, verse 4. So Calvinism, what they teach is that man does not have free will. They believe that everything is under the control of God. One of their doctrines supporting this teaching, where man does not have free will, but he is under the control of God, is this heretical teaching called irresistible grace. Irresistible grace, what this is, is that when God puts his grace upon a person, then a person has no free choice. And then he cannot resist it. God says no. So when God says no, and then he makes the puts his grace on the person, the person cannot resist it. So in other words, if you got saved by grace today, it's not of your own free choice. It's because God put some kind of grace upon you that you could not resist. That's how they argue in the doctrine of Calvinism. And liberal schools have taken so much advantage of this wicked doctrine where it demonized Christians about God being sovereign over all, man having no free choice. And because God is in control of everything, everything is God's fault, including the sufferings and the pain of this world. It's not man taking accountability and responsibility for it. Okay, but anyways, let's look at this one passage right here. Psalms chapter 65, verse 4. Notice it seemed like that God willed and he chose certain people to be irresistibly enforced to receive his salvation by grace. He willed it, and he seemed to have enforced it. Psalms chapter 65, verse 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest. Ooh. So notice that God chose the man. And causes to approach unto thee. So notice that this man, he was chosen by God, and that's why he approached to God for salvation. That he may dwell in thy courts we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. So case number one right here is Psalms chapter 65, verse 4. So you enter God's court up in heaven because he chose you. You did not choose him. But look at this. The ones, the simple answer is the ones whom God chose and caused are those who what? Look at this. Dwell in thy courts, thy house, even of thy holy temple. These are the people whom God chose and caused. This has nothing to do with individual salvation. You notice that? There is no, nothing right here where it has to do with individual salvation. But rather what? Here's the key right here. Notice when Calvinists always look at predestinate, elect, chose, blah, blah, blah. They automatically assume saved. Salvation, salvation, salvation. So that is what? Seventh-day Adventist interpretation. Just like them. They're able to <clears throat> insert words in there that fooled you, that you can't catch. So saved is not found in that passage. What is it? It's an ordination. So ordained, that, that'll be a better word. Okay, so notice right here, they are ordained to do God's work at the temple. That's who God chose and caused. So let's read this again. The idea is this, is that you'll notice right here that at verse 4, the man who dwells in the courts and who is satisfied with the goodness of God's house, these are the people that God has chosen to what? Work for him in the temple. That is the same case. If you have a desire and a love to serve God in the church, obviously those are the kind of people that God would like to choose. And if he decided to choose you, there is nothing where your individual will is involved right here that, no, you know, I don't think that I don't want to do it. And then God says, okay, you know, you don't have to do it. No, if God chose you as, hey, you're going to pastor this church, Gene, at San Jose. And because I chose you, you're going to do this work. So guess what? Hey, 
I got to do it. You know why? Because God chose me to do what he called me to do. So I can't quit even if I wanted to, like Jonah. But what happened? Jonah, God's like, no, 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 I had to work for you. So he sent in a big, great fish to swallow him up, teach him a lesson in hell. And Jonah's like, okay, I'll do it. See, God, he can choose people, choose and cause some people who are ordained workers to minister in, in the temple without their say in the matter. So this is something that you better look at your own heart. If God called you to preach, guess what? You can try to run, but you're not going to be able to run from God. You can try to hide, but you're not going to hide from God. God's going to get you one way or another. Oh, I got free choice so I can drink, smoke, and dance, do whatever I want. I don't have to pastor a church. Run away, little boy. Run away because daddy's going to get you. Psalms chapter 110, verse 3. Psalms chapter 110, verse 3. Here's another passage that seems to show that God chose and caused and willed certain people to be irresistibly enforced. Psalms chapter 110, and we will be, and we will read, not be, we will read verse 3. I'm sounding like a Calvinist. We have to be, okay. Verse 3, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Ooh, ooh, look at that. See, there is no free will. So God willed them to do it this according to his power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. But notice right here that... Again, they're inserting their interpretation right here. The people are willing to serve him in what? The day of thy power. Did they pay attention to what they were reading right here? Psalms 110 verse 3, right? It's not now. In what day? The day of thy power. Now let me ask you this question right here. What certain day will God manifest his power and force where people don't have a free choice in the matter and he does dictatorship over the whole world? That's the millennium. Look at verse 1. Verse 1. Psalms chapter 106. Uh, excuse me, 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord... Look at this, sit thou at my right hand until what? I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, he's enforcing rule, dictatorship. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the what? Midst of thine enemies. See, Jesus is ruling over all the Antichrist kingdom. They're taken over. That's why what? Verse 3, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Yeah, no kidding, right? No kidding. That's why if you look at this passage, at, look at also verse 5 and 6. The Lord at thy right hand shall what? Strike through kings in which day? The day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. Yeah, no kidding, right? God does that. Okay, says the atheist. I'll worship you. Oh, I'm an agnostic and I'm a... No, 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 you're going to bow the knee and you will say Jesus is Lord. I don't care if you're Muslim. I don't care if you're a Mason. I don't care if you're Catholic. I don't care if you're a Baptist. You're all going to bow the knee and say, okay, God, I worship you. Oh, I believe in free choice. No, 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 God, no free choice. Boom, you're going to bow the knee. So see, this has nothing to do right here with today's salvation plan. What does this have to do with Calvinism where God gave you his grace... And then you're trying to resist it, and God said, no, no. This has to do with what? In the day of thy power, the millennium, when God takes over the kingdoms of this world. And at that time, people have to worship him, no matter if you're on God's side or not. You're going to bow the knee. Okay, let's also look at John chapter 5, verse 21. John chapter 5, verse 21. Now, this is one of the favorite passages used by Calvinists where God will and chose certain people and they cannot resist his power. Look at John chapter 5, verse 21. 
So notice that God can choose whoever he wants to make alive to get saved. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Look at that. So whoever the Son chooses, then they will be resurrected. That seemed to be the case right here. Now, it's true that the Son has the right to will whoever he wanted to physically raise from the dead. So, an example is Lazarus, right? Another example is the widow's son and Jairus' daughter. The Lord raised them up from the dead. But what you got to understand is this. It was not referring to the Son willing to whoever he wanted to spiritually save from the dead. See, the Calvinists, they try to make this uh, spiritual raising from the dead the same thing as God physically resurrecting from the dead right here. Because when a dead person is resurrected by Jesus Christ, that corpse is literally a dead corpse having no free choice. That's the analogy Calvinists want you to think about with your spiritual salvation, that you're completely dead, so you're incapable of making free choice to resist. So if Jesus raised you from the dead to be saved, to be spiritually alive, spiritually saved, then that has to happen to you. What you got to look at is the previous verse shows the quickening of the dead, the resurrection of the dead, is part of Jesus' works, the Son's works. Look at verse 20. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. See that? This has to do with the works. And then verse 20, uh, notice right here, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. And because of these works, verse 21, that has to do with the resurrection. So this resurrection has to, has to be part of the Son's works. Or it would re be referring to outward physical miracles that Jesus did. Because here's another example. Look at chapter 9, verse 2. Chapter 9, verse 2. What you're going to find out is that when the Son has the right to will, uh, to will whoever he wants to resurrect or to quicken, that is very true because this is part of the Son's works, the Son's miracles. Jesus Christ can will whoever he wanted to heal of a disease, to resurrect from the dead, etc., etc. It has nothing to do with an individual spiritually getting saved here. That's what they're trying to do with this quickening, this resurrection. That's what they're trying to do. Trying to make this resurrection referring to your spirit becoming alive, getting saved. That's what they're trying to do. But look at chapter 9, verse 2 through 6. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, <clears throat> this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the what? Works of God should be made manifest in him. See, part of the son's works, God's works, is doing miracles, which is why this man was blind. So this man was blind because God was going to do a work later on. Verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me. See that? While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Look at that. And then 5 and 6, notice right here, he healed the blind man. This has to do with his outward physical miracles. Look at chapter 10, verse 38. Chapter 10, verse 38. Notice right here. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the what? Works. What is his wor works? Uh, excuse me, John 10, 38. I just lost my place right here. Yep, that's right. That ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. So notice right here what Jesus Christ is doing is that he can will whoever he wants to heal, to raise from the dead physically, and to cure of a sickness. And the reason why he does all these things is because the verses is part of the works of the Father. These are part of the works of the Father. And then why does Jesus Christ do these works of the Father? He mentioned at John 10, 38, so that they may be able to believe. But guess what? Did they believe? No, they resisted. 
What happened? I thought they were irresistibly given that grace where when Jesus did this work that they cannot resist. No, it doesn't matter. Even if the son wills whoever he wanted to heal, that wasn't going to do with their individual salvation. That's not going to force them to get saved. Amen. They could resist that. Look at that right there. In fact, look at John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. So let's look at the spiritual quickening or the spiritual resurrection that they want to talk about right here. Notice right here that at the quickening that has to do with your spiritual resurrection is not found where the Calvinists want it at verse 21. It's not mentioned until verse 24. 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. There's your resurrection. You're made alive. And shall not come into condemnation, but is what? Passed from death unto life. There's your resurrection. And what is that based upon? Not Jesus Christ putting an irresistible grace where they, where they have no free will. No, they have to believe on him. See that? It's based on a condition. It's based on a condition. If they want to insist, no, this has to do with an irresistible grace when they're spiritually saved, then what you need to do is show them John chapter 10, verse 38 right there. And John 10, 38 says Jesus did those works. And remember, John 5 says, John 5, I wrote down verse 21 right here. Notice that this has to do with the works, right? Of Jesus with whoever he wills. And then the works of Jesus with whoever he wills has to do with his miracles, remember. And remember, he does these miracles. Why? So this person can believe. But notice that at John 10, 38, that they still didn't believe. No matter how Jesus willed it for his works. So what does that mean? That means you can resist this. This is not irresistible. This is resistible. Okay, let's look at James chapter 1, verse 18. James chapter 1, verse 18. Here's another Calvinist passage. That basically God seemed to chose and he elected those he willed and chose them where they cannot resist his grace. Once more, James chapter 1, verse 18, it seems to show that kind of, con uh, that kind of interpretation. The Bible says right here, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Uh-oh, so of his own will we were begotten, we got saved. See that? What's the simple answer to this? The simple answer to this one is that obviously God gave birth to us of his own will, not our own will. Why? Because we received Christ for salvation first and because we chose to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation for, first, he willed it that those who get saved, who believe on his son, get born again and you cannot resist that. John chapter 1 verse 12. Oh, isn't that simple? John chapter 1, verse 12. Oh, so notice right here, God willed it, so you can't get uh, born again of your free choice. See, that's how they trick you. It's true that when you are born again, the new birth, there is no free choice, free will involved, but in the context right here where God gives the birth, God does the process of birth. Did we do it of our own will? No, we cannot do it. We cannot... Uh, make ourselves spiritually born. God has to do that with our own action, with our own will. But he can only do that when your free choice to receive and believe Jesus Christ first. See that? And look, no matter how much your free will is involved, this proves eternal security then. You cannot undo your new birth. Amen. You. Boom. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received them, him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. See, if you receive Jesus Christ for salvation, God put the power in there where you become his child, 
you become born. Verse 13, that's why which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See? So that's why your will is not involved right here. It's all God's will involved, where you become his saved child if you choose to receive him for salvation. If you choose to receive him for your salvation, no matter what will you want to put into it, with how many sins you commit in your life, you can't undo your salvation. Your will cannot undo God's will. Amen. Look at that. So this truly proves salvation by grace through faith then. 